welcome everyone to the Kuban. to uh, the IDEA Pitch Competition. I'm Marika Siegel, I'm Dean of the Pavlis Honors College, and I'll just be kicking things off tonight. Um, you can see the agenda here for your information. So we'll have um, some opening remarks, um, give some introductions, I'll introduce the awards, uh, we'll have the student pitches, um, then we'll have a short break followed by some more student pitches, uh, there'll be a chance to vote for your audience favorite, and then awards presentation. Wrap up actually. That'll be easier. Okay. <laughs> so welcome. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit first about Husky Innovate. So Husky Innovate is Michigan Tech's Innovation and Entrepreneurship Resource Center. And it's a Pavlis Honors College program that's open to uh, Michigan Tech students across campus. Uh, this program is offered in collaboration with the College of Business and the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Or, I'm sorry, the Office of Innovation and Commercialization. I always want to say Entrepreneurship and Innovation. So the Office of Innovation and Commercialization. So through this collaboration, we're able to offer a wide range of opportunities and resources. So opportunities like this one that you're all participating in tonight. So we offer a co-curricular program designed to give students the experience. Pitch competition. Oh. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, designed to give students experience. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my place here. As innovators, whether they're working creatively in the alley makerspace, solving a challenging problem on campus, um, such as in the University Innovation Fellows Program. Um, offered in collaboration with Stanford's D School, or pitching an idea at a pitch competition such as this very one that we are all at tonight. Husky Innovate's co-curricular program um, aligns really well with the Pavlis Honors College's pedagogical focus on experiential learning and self-authorship. So today's idea pitch is a celebration of the beginning of innovation, which is the idea. Hence, the idea pitch. So innovation just can't happen without first, you know, having the guts to share your innovative idea with someone and taking that first step. It starts with a mindset and it starts with a willingness to reframe a problem as an opportunity. So today, um, we're encouraging all the students participating to take that first step and share an innovative idea. Um, that idea could lead to a startup that uh, offers a new product or a new service or just challenges the status quo and gives us just a new way of experiencing the world and doing things. Everything starts with the idea. And I really applaud all of you who are having the courage to take that first step and take the plunge and share your innovative ideas with us today. So let's just give preemptively all the participants a round of applause. I'd like now to introduce our judges and judges as I say your name and introduce you. If you could just give a little wave to the audience. Um, so first, Ellie Asgari, who is a Gates professor in the College of Business. Jason Mack, VP of Business Development at the MTEC Smart Zone and an MTU alum. Dale Golden, master's student in engineering management and a very successful pitcher herself. Is that a word, pitcher? We'll go with yeah, not this kind of picture, but what he pitches, right? Um, Dan Green, an entrepreneur and principal at Blackfin Group, also an MTU alum. Kurt Terhune, senior engineer at Orbion Space Technology and an assistant professor in our College of Engineering. Aaron Gustafson, UX researcher, GE Aerospace, and an MTU alum. I love to see all the MTU alums. And Carolyn Urena, owner and principal, Urena Consulting, LLC, and the founder of Sisu Global. Now I'll introduce our prizes for the night. 
So first place is a $200 prize. Second place, $100. Third place, $50. There's a $25 award for an honorable mention. $100 for audience favorite, so that's what you'll all get a chance to vote on later today. And uh, $200 for the Social Impact Award. Um, I'd like to thank Dan and Jane Green for um, sponsoring the Audience Favorite Award, and uh, Dr. Elias Gari for sponsoring the Social Impact Award. So thank you very much. And now I'm going to turn it over to our MC. This is Praise Aramaselli. She is pursuing a master's in business administration and also working with Lisa Casper, the director of Husky Innovate. So we're very happy to have her as a part of the team. So welcome, Praise. Come on up. All right, thank you so much, Marika, for that lovely introduction. And welcome, everyone, to this year's Idea Pitch competition. We're excited to have you and congratulations in advance to all the participants because, you know, I've fished myself before, not here, but I know it can be quite intense, but um, to make it this far and to have the boldness to present your idea is already a wonderful achievement, so congratulations to you. Right, so while the first presenter gets ready, I'm just going to go over what we'll be having tonight. So each student is expected to have three minutes to pitch their idea and our judges are going to give about two minutes of feedback to each student, and these are the guidelines by which our judges will be judging each presentation that's delivered here tonight. So first, we want to know, is that idea or concept clear? Can we understand it based on your presentation? Secondly, is it new? Is it innovative? And then the third, which is extremely important, is the value proposition. So when we're talking about the value proposition, we mean what pain, what um, problem are you addressing specifically? You know, what are you trying to resolve? And then your delivery is how you present tonight, how you tell us about your idea. And we're also trying to make sure that there's an, an alignment between your value proposition and that solution. So are you, is your solution really resolving that pain point that you said it would resolve? And then there is the social or environmental impact of your idea. So without further ado, I'm gonna welcome the first presenter tonight, which is Max Schramm. Max. Max Graham, and I'm here to talk to you tonight about net negative commissions. So it was summer of 2022, I got the opportunity to go on the um, MTU study abroad in Costa Rica. I was able to study, study sustainability, population science, and I got cultural immersion. On that trip, we saw a lot of different things, including the cloud forest, which was amazing to see, and it's great that companies are claiming that they are net zero emissions by protecting areas like these, but with that, they aren't protecting or regenerating the areas that they're operating in or causing destruction in, which is leading to ecological dead zones. Now it's great that they're protecting these areas. I don't want to say that they shouldn't protect these areas, but they need to focus on regenerating their own areas. Also, if the company is managing their own area well, that they're causing destruction in, or sorry, not causing destruction in, um, and they're operating in different places around the world, they can also focus on desert greening. This is a process that's really new, definitely will not be profitable in the short run, but we can give incentives to these companies like R&D credits so they can deduct those from their business expenses and put a nice fancy label of net negative emissions on their company. So the problems so that this idea can solve are deforestation, pollution, and energy crisis, and these will obviously all be in good time, but the idea needs to be set in place now. And the big thing of this is it's a huge scope, global impact, all um, mainly developed countries with the headquarters of these corporate corporations need to adopt this principle of net negative emissions. And not only do the corporations need to adopt this, but the consumers need to buy into this idea as well. Because if the consumers aren't backing into these products or these companies that are net negative emissions, they're gonna have to pivot and the idea <coughs> may not make it as far as it needs to. And the impact is that this needs to work because as of 2019, the United Nations said that we only had 11 years 
to solve the problem of uh, climate change, and now that's only eight years. So we've got to get this into effect fast. And the impact that this can have is it'll change businesses and consumer behaviors. So consumers will be receiving products that are better for themselves and for the environment, and they will know that these companies are protecting the areas that they're operating in. And the companies can feel better and the CEOs can sleep better at night knowing that they are doing something better for the world and they really are improving it while providing their customers value through better products. And all in all, this can reshape our trajectory and hopefully we can beat those eight years and figure this out. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the panel? your target customer here specifically because you, I think you talked about broadly a lot of companies but um, do you have any specific target customer type when you talk about uh, these companies? Definitely I would say companies like Amazon and Apple and Google all that have a huge societal reach and also are operating in many different countries if they can start to adopt these principles they've already adopted the net zero emissions, they're all working very hard with EVs and different things to get to that point. And companies like those are also buying other areas, like I said in the beginning, to protect those areas, which is great and we need to sustain, but we also need to regenerate. So those top few companies really need to buy into this idea and actually implement it. And we'd also need the government support of R&D credits or tax breaks or different things like that so we can financially incentivize those corporations as well. For your, for your idea, um, are you thinking about would you be doing the certification itself or would you be partnering with someone else to do that certification? I think my idea from the beginning, obviously this is a huge idea, but um, I think a good mix of having that certification, like something like a LEED certification or something like that where they can actually have a label and a process to get through that, while also giving them a consulting service to maintain that customer relationship, help them along the way, and obviously this is a huge problem, so they're gonna have problems along the way and different difficulties based on what company they are. Maybe they have different ideas. So working with them to consult along the way with a dynamic issue and helping them with different things that can come their way and like keeping that relationship strong. Got it, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Max. So, while the next presenter gets ready, uh, we know we're talking about innovation tonight and there's this concept called disruptive innovation and this is just something for us to reflect on. You don't have to answer out loud, but just think about what your idea of disruptive innovation is. All right, so disruptive innovation is an innovation that transforms the market or creates a new one through simplicity or and accessibility. An emphasis on the simplicity, right? Being able to easily you know, bring that to people, which is something I hope we can glean a little bit of insight from. Right, so just a reminder, please put your phones in silent mode so, you know, the presenters do not get interrupted. And now let's welcome our next presenter, Viraj. Viraj and Vimalesh, they're working as a team. Let's please give a round of applause to them. checking the thesis and dissertation. So every year the university gets thesis and dissertation as the academic work of a student and they have to evaluate it manually for formatting instructions. So each 
for a document requires around 30 minutes for evaluation and our product can really help to bring this 30 minutes down to like 5 minutes so the university so each university has like 8 to 10 parameters on which they evaluate and this can be, this these are all done manually right now and uh, we have like good knowledge of programming and we are into masters in data science so by our product so this is the cycle that goes through so uh, each student submit, submits his document and then then it get evaluated by the grad school of each university and if there are corrections required in terms of formatting it's it is rejected the student again has to make corrections then submit his document then gets evaluated so this entire process goes around for two weeks at the at the end of the semester and for each document it takes like around 30 to 45 minutes but some universities do it in two steps they take first draft then second draft which allows allow them which allows them to divide their time so for this we did some market research so we found that there is a university who got 54 documents in this summer semester and so this was the second submission and for each submission they required from 50, 15 minutes to cross check all those submission like formatting requirements and even though it was second submission there was total 129 total errors found in this uh, like they were checking it for 10 parameters and our product can evaluate six parameters within five seconds and yeah reducing the total time by 70 percent and saving 66 percent of the time yeah that was it thank you We are doing customer discovery and we figured out that every university has like 8 to 10 common parameters so we can easily like standardize all those for each and every university like there are two three other different parameters for that we have to customize it for every university. Uh, this will be a web application because uh, the student will upload his PDF, get his, uh, get his results, and he can do his instant evaluation within like five, six seconds. But for further evaluation, he has to submit his document to the university because there are like personal information from the student's banner record. So that he has to do. So is, is your product limited to six parameters or can it be? It can be more, but right now with the time and the expertise we have, we have developed six hours. What other, what other adjacent technologies or similar technologies exist that do this today? So we, yeah, we did some research, but uh, right now, uh, so they are doing it manually using Adobe Acrobat, and they, some universities, they ask students to use Overleaf, but even though, so I'm a graduate worker who evaluates this thesis and dissertation, and I've seen like even overleaf submission, there are errors. So yeah, so there is a need for this platform so that it can really help students. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, yes, is this scalable? Is there any other applications you can use this for other than just for this specific application of it? Yeah, right now we haven't gone through it. Right now, this is the only application we think of. All right. Thank you very much. OK, that was a great presentation. I mean, all the presentations are great. I'm just making that comment, <laughs> not, not because I favor that one. <laughs> and right, as we move to the next presenter, Here's something for us to think about. How can I come up with an idea? Everyone here, of course, has come up with an idea before, but we're just giving a little something for you to get some insight from. So you can borrow ideas from, from other industries or geographies. And Picasso said, good artists copy, great artists steal. You know, there's a book I really love that talks about this. It's called Steal Like an Artist by Austin Cleon. I don't know how many of us have read it, 
but I really love that book. And if you're an inventor, sometimes you're thinking, oh, everything has to be original. But in reality, we build on each other's ideas, and that's how the human civilization has progressed so far. So that's something you can do as well. So we're going to welcome the next presenter quickly, and that is Alia Maxwell Abrams. Hope I got that right. Welcome, Alia. A round of applause for her, please. advertisements and single-use paper. Well, my name is Aaliyah, um, and I'm a second-year civil engineering major, and I'm eager to present you my sustainable solution. All right, cool. So back to the table tents. Um, how do we, as a college, disseminate information sustainably? Well, I'm glad you guys asked. What about a digital display? Well, with a digital display, that could fall into a category where it's something that is customizable for all organizations that will be using it. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> okay, so it's not just about the prevalence of table tents, though. Consider our devices. We're so linked to them. So what happens when you're walking from point A to B um, and you forget your charger at school? So it's, imagine having like a universal hub that offers uh, convenience through file sharing, Bluetooth connectivity, internet access, tutorials, and a charging station, all in one place. Now picture a portable uh, safety uh, device capable of going uh, throughout campus, uh, effectively addressing emergency situations. Well, that portable device is the Sunny Buddy. So, with the Sunny Buddy, it combines uh, portable kiosk stations with solar energy that's uh, easily pro programmable through these stations. Now, we need our Sunny Buddies because we want to further our advancement in machine learning, uh, optimize energy usage, as well as, as, well as combat uh, climate change. Now, with scientists projecting a, one point, a temperature limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius in 2035, it's essential for us to rethink how we're approaching these sustainable solutions. So, just think of it. <clears throat> a self-sustaining hub that promotes environmentally conscious energy use through instructional guides, customer feedback, uh, digital information sources, and even a, ener a solar energy cooker. Um, Sunny Buddy provides access to standalone uh, linkable solar energy systems. Now, who does this serve? So, Sunny Buddies represent a unique chance to uh, motivate community. Uh, participation and urge departments to showcase their research and invest in sustainable solutions. Uh, Sunny Buddies cater to a uh, college environment seeking interactive programs uh, and platforms beyond personal devices, offering a versatile, portable, and sustainable hub to meet diverse needs. My vision is to prioritize connectivity and customization uh, in sustainable solutions, ensuring they are universally accessible to end users. By collaborating with um, and receiving their valuable feedback and promoting the mission of sustainability, the overarching goal is to assist, without, uh, to assist people without access to electricity uh, through these standalone solar-powered portable kiosk stations. By adopting these sustainable approaches, college campuses can significantly reduce their environmental footprint and promote sustainable and accessible solutions. Thank you for your time. Sorry. <laughs> So the idea of this, uh, like think of a department, um, for example, I'm a part of the CEGE department, which is Civil Environmental Geospatial. So if they wanted to present their research and they purchase a Sunny Buddy, they would be able to uh, put it in front of Fisher, for example, um, but then they could pre-program it to go from one part of the campus to the other side. So that way we can access more people in regards to our research. Great, thank you. Any more questions? 
So with our, so these are all AI-generated images. None of them are actually what it's going to be end up looking like. So for example, we have like a tablet or a kiosk, but it would be built into the Sunny Bunny, but it would be approachable through this like humanoid type of uh, aesthetic. Have you thought about making this uh, compatible with portable phones? I mean, yeah, exactly. Great question. So with portable phones, um, and that could be Samsung, Google phone, Apple phone, yes, that would be the goal to have the connectivity. Um, so as we can see, like if we think of standalone uh, kiosk stations, we don't always see that type of connectivity. So we really want to encourage that so it could uh, reach a more broader scope of end users. Yeah, so that's a great question as well. Um, the original goal of this idea was to, um, I guess, address everybody's issue. Now, that's not really appropriate for a business platform. You have to really narrow down on your score, scope. However, the goal of the company is to uh, address electricity disparities in like developing co countries, for example. Now, that would, um, I guess, be developed further along once it's already commercially available. going to move forward. And here's something to think about before we do that. What do innovators look for to inspire them? You're all innovators here, and you know you can think about what you personally look for to inspire you. And here's what Husky Innovate has to say. You can look for a job to be done. This is the most important thing, well, in my opinion. And you have to find a problem that needs to be solved. Where there's a problem that needs to be solved, there's an innovation to be made. And uh, let's welcome the next presenter, Ben. No. Oh, no Ben. Ben? All right, so I guess we'll be moving forward. The next presenter gets ready, you ready? Okay, so I'll quickly move forward then. Michael Ngala. Connection. Uh, how did this idea come about? One of the most important things about being a college student is all about um, networking and socializing. Apart from uh, doing your exams and passing your exams and graduating and looking for a job here, yeah? so um, I may talk with people and socialize with people a lot uh, when I came here. And uh, I'm a foreign student, international student from Kenya, so I talked to a couple of students here and. Uh, during one of our interactions, uh, yeah, eventually uh, asked her for a phone number because I wanted to keep in touch, and she was like, I'm sorry, I don't know you like that. So uh, that was like, oh, so um, how do you guys communicate? She was like, uh, maybe I could give you my email or something. So I was like, oh, so you use email to communicate. I was like, okay. So as I continue to network and socialize with other students, uh, a platform of students use different types of social media. Uh, you can see sometimes they use Discord, they use uh, Instagram, Snapchat, and X. So I always end up having to download a lot of like social media platforms just to be able to communicate with a lot of students. So I was like, hmm, why don't we have a centralized social media platform just exclusively for college students to be able to communicate with one another, you know? So uh, this is where Campus Connection comes in, to be able to allow students to have a centralized social media platform for you to be able to communicate with one another, to be able to network, to be able to socialize, be notified of school events, you know. Uh, if you want to post about uh, something that has happened during the, the day in your uh, life as a college student, you could post it there. Maybe uh, the food that what's what sucked today, so you could post it there. So that's one of the things that I was thinking about when it comes to campus connection. So what do we offer? We offer the ability for students to be able to search for other students uh, in regards to their major. Maybe you want to link up with somebody who does biochemistry or who has done uh, calculus in the previous semester. You could search for them on Campus Connection. Maybe you want to link up with someone at Harvard or at uh, 
uh, Stanford, you could search them up on Campus Connection. So it's basically a way for college students to interact with one another. Uh, some of the services we offer, we uh, will have like board games for students to interact with one another. Uh, we have like uh, be able to post your resumes there for students to be able to link up with one another. So uh, this is sort of like a small thing that we're working on. Uh, this is a campus connection. Uh, you can put your, th your thoughts up there. Uh, you can put your pictures. Maybe you take a picture of the food at what's what today, how it sucked, so you could display it on there. Uh, maybe you had activities at career fair, you could put it on there. So it's basically a way for students to be able to connect with one another without being weird. You know, some people don't like sharing their phone numbers, and I get that. Uh, back in my country, sharing phone numbers is an easy thing. So here I get it, it's quite different. So yeah, uh, welcome on board. Thank you. So basically we're hoping for also support from the schools as well. It's going to be an exclusively uh, student platform, so you, have to only, you can only register with your student email ID. So it's going to be like a, sort of like a student thing um, through marketing. We're hoping to combine it in such a way that it's sort of like a, sort of like a Discord, sort of like a Facebook at the same time, and so, sort of like a LinkedIn to be able to network. I know for like uh, incoming students, they want to get to, to know about the school, social events, and for senior students who are leaving, they want to be able to network and get referrals when looking for employment. So we're hoping to give those kinds of push. Where do you expect revenue to come in from this product? So uh, our basic revenue comes from uh, advertisement-based revenue. Having uh, students join in, we can uh, market it to companies and tell them we have a high uh, user content. One of the other things is also to have like uh, extra parts for students. Maybe you could purchase board games, maybe play chess games with other students online. Uh, it's a way to interact with other students, so those extra parts would be for premium payments as well. Would there be collaboration across different university group and groups, or would you be branding it, for example, for Michigan Tech? Would only Michigan Tech students be able to talk with each other? Yeah, so definitely we're going to have like sort of like two domains. Uh, one domain, the home domain, is for your own school. You're going to be able to follow the clubs that you like to follow, the school administration, your friends from uh, your own school. Then we can have the external domain whereby you can be able to link up with uh, students from other uh, universities, maybe even professors from other universities as well. progress. As we move forward to our next presentation, here's something, once again, for us to think about. How do I spot opportunities for innovation? Now, those who have presented tonight, you can think, how do you spot your own opportunity? And see if it aligns with this. You go to the source, the customer. Funny enough, a lot of innovators, especially when you go to startup uh, boot camps, you meet a lot of people who have these wonderful ideas. You know, they've developed amazing technology, and you're like, okay, who's your customer? Have you talked to your customer? What are they saying? And they're like, I mean, this technology is going to change the world. But like, have you talked to your customer? And one movie I would recommend is General Magic. Funny enough, I, I almost cried when I watched the movie because it's a story of how a wonderful product lacks customers and fails. So you could check that out, right? And now let's welcome our next presenter, that is Nihal Shiwari. Nihal. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Nihal. Uh, as we all know, since the, very, since the very beginning of human existence, uh, humans have thrived by working together. It's not because they they uh, they had to help each other, but but because they knew that by helping each other, there'll be uh, betterment for everyone, and uh, the world will survive, and the society will be there for the betterment of everyone. So in the fourth millennium BC, there was ancient civilizations, and people help each help each other to build the civilization. And after that, uh, people helped each other in 1918 Spanish flu, and then in 2001 tsunami in Japan. 
I don't know what's wrong with the formatting. Uh, it's uh, sorry for that. And in recently during COVID-19 pandemic, uh, people help each other by doing their best with what they can do. So with this, we know that uh, if humans help each other, it's better world for all. But what's the problem today? The problem today is let's take it with the example. Here's Max and here's currently a marketing management senior year student doing research project about consumer behavior. But for his project, he is looking for people to interview from different countries. He's a very good guitarist and loves to play tennis. But what's the problem with him? He don't know anyone from different country. The data available online is not appropriate as per the research. Can't uh, approach people on social media randomly to take interviews. This one more example of uh, Emily who is 29 and, and is female and is, co and, and is working as a copywriter and designer. Uh, he, uh, she works in a consumer tech startup as a designer and copywriter. She loves traveling and likes learning new things, but she usually don't get time for self-care. What's the problem with her? She don't know where to go on weekends and what to Sorry, uh, what's the problem with her? She don't know where to go on weekends and what to do and online recommendations are not useful. Looking to move to new city but don't know anyone. Willing to help uh, people but aren't try, uh, willing to help people who are trying to learn design and looking to use her talent for different purposes. So here comes the solution. Help me. Help me is a one-stop solution for connecting people who are looking to help or uh, who are uh, seeking for help. What help me does? Uh, you can schedule one-on-one -on -one call with people who are willing to help or ask for help in the community. People can build their social ratings by helping each other and being kind and get incentives based on that. Apart from that, people can receive tips from uh, on one click in return for helping and being kind for from others. Users can help brands and companies to fulfill to fulfill their needs like filling surveys, filling feedback forms, selling their products, etc. In return of incentives. Apart from that. Uh, People can get tokens for completing the help and redeem those tokens for relevant discount, discounts and coupons. So what's the uh, potential in this? Like 81% uh, people think that pe uh, taking help from people with same interest and expertise creates a sense of uh, community according to Pew Research Center. People can earn potential, uh, potential, people have potential to earn money by charging for your expertise to help others. Game-like features such as leaderboard, awards, tokens have the potential to grab the share as gamif gamification market will reach 30.7 billion in 2025 and this app is completely a gamified version. Uh, it, it has a direct impact on the community setting like it helps in reducing loneliness and stress and cre create a sense of belongingness. Uh, all, always have someone real to help you out in terms of crisis who can help with expertise. Also it can give social rewards such as helping others activate brain areas like uh, pleasure, social connection and trust with helping and it really stress. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so uh, yeah, so currently I did a um, uh, survey uh, among people of different groups and I received 219 responses. And as for that, currently I will be focusing on three categories, which is education and tutoring, creative writing and learning, and the third one is technological and technology and gadgets. And after that, I'll uh, I'll be expanding it to further categories. And in future, if possible, it, it is a scalable solution, and it can be uh, further expanded into offline communities and offline programs. So, how did you come up with this idea? Uh, so, uh, I live in Upper Daniel Heights and once I was, uh, during uh, my winter vacation, I had to go to New York and it was having a really bad snowstorm. So, I was, I, I had a bus near Mub uh, bus stand and I had to walk uh, from Upper Daniel to Mub, but I had no one to help me out. Like, no one asked, I mean, I, I asked people to help me out, but I don't think what they, I mean, what they thought of and they didn't help me because there was no incentives from there for them to help me out. So I thought what if, if we give incentive to those people who are willing, who are not willing to help, but if we give incentive, they are willing to help. 
or people are willing to help but they don't know how to help or whom to help so this platform will be those for those people who are willing to help but they don't know how to help and the people who are seeking for help Yeah. So basically, the uh, the MVP will include the tip section. Uh, people will be able to, if they like, they're helping, or I mean, if they if their uh, things are getting fulfilled, they can receive, they can give tips to the help. I mean, the people who are helping. And after that, uh, we can add uh, the discounts and coupon as a gift, or we can just gift uh, the person rather than bartering. Bartering also can be the good option, but currently I haven't thought of it. is 1981 so I mean there are so many opinions on this online but according to Britannica the first laptop was called the Osborne one that's the first one that hit the market and that was in April 1981 that's a long time ago and we're gonna welcome our next presenter who is Olamide Ayeni Olamide. So, if you've ever bought a used product before, thank you. You're one of the amazing people that is making the planet to fight, that is helping the planet to fight um, waste pollution. So, my name is Ola Hayen. I'm a co-founder of Upcycle. According to World Bank, more than 2 billion tons of municipal solid waste end on landfills every year. The problem is this. Waste is one of the major contributors to pollution in the world. Unfortunately, 40% of this waste are actually recyclable and reusable, meaning they don't have any business being on that upside. And we created Upcycle to solve this problem. Upcycle is a marketplace solution for both end of life and end of use products. What do we do? For end of life products, we upcycle them into sustainable, eco-friendly products, just exactly like this Ottoman you see this beautiful girl sitting on. It's made from tire. For end of use products, we sell them to users or to buyers who are interested to buy this product. And we do this through the website or the apps, making it easy for people through a click to buy or to sell. We target universities to them because we understand that they constantly change their lifestyles at low budget. We also target low income earners, especially people living in developing nations who want to live, um, buy the basic things of life but they have low budget. We are different from every other solutions, um, organizations offering the solutions because we have the knowledge and expertise involved in the circular economy sector and waste management. And we also have um, business experience working in Africa, which is part of the area we want to operate in. Um, the team comes with a total combined experience of 25 years across product design, project management, circular economy, and um, technical skills. We're looking for partners, for mentors, for influencers. Thank you. Often so easy just to throw things away, right? Yeah. Yes. 
So the problem is we notice that uh, because of the fast fashion and a lot of things, people buy things they don't need anymore. Research shows that people use phones for just two years. After that, they want to change the phone. It's not because the phone is bad, it's just because they're tired of it, or there's a new version or model they want to work with. Or somewhere in the world, somebody needs the phone. So what happens to it? Or you have something you want to throw away, maybe you don't wear your vacuum cleaner and somebody needs it, but you need a laptop that somebody wants to throw away. So you have a platform to exchange and pay less, or you sell and make money. So for us, we make money from selling, we also make money from upcycling those products. We also make money when you exchange. So even though we are doing like a social enterprise, but it's also like an hybrid between both profits and um, not for profits. Yeah. So I have a comment and a question. So the comment of you did a really great job with the best practice of asking for help and having a mask at the end of your presentation. I think that's the first time you've seen that, so good job. Um, second is my question. In 2016, I started a company called Pearl Recycling. Mm -hmm. um, what we do basically is to work with end-of-life products. Yeah. We convert them, we upcycle them into other things, um, towels and all of that. Um, coming here for my master's studies, I realized that we have a lot of end-of-use products. Basically, people throw away things and you can pick them up. So it was just a way to incorporate that. We have an existing business relationship in Africa, so that's why it's very easy for us to you know, leverage on that, not reinventing the wheel, just taking hold of what we have already, mm -hmm. and then scaling into all that we ask from time to time. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we have come a bit of a long way, and we're going to take a five-minute break, and then we'll be back with more amazing presentations. So just stretch your legs, everyone. My name is Meg and I'm the student director at the Alley Maker Space. The Alley is just one of the many initiatives that Husky Innovate manages. Down here, our students are innovators, future business leaders, and I am in constant awe of the amazing things we've seen made down here. In my four years working with the Alley Maker Space, I've seen students come down here not just to create, but to learn and grow and find their place at Michigan Tech. These opportunities give students the confidence to think big and foster their potential to change the world. But to turn their dreams into reality, we need your support. With your generous donation, you're not just supporting a project, you're helping invest in the future of Huskies. By supporting Husky Innovate, you're empowering the next generation of entrepreneurs who will drive innovation, create jobs, and change lives. So as we just load the slides, the next presenter can start getting ready. Okay, so for our next presentation, let's welcome Alex Masali. Round of applause, Alex. Hello everyone, my name is Alex Masali. I'm a first year mechanical engineer, and I'm here to present Eternity. So let me paint the picture. A couple years ago, my grandpa and I were playing golf, and he says to me, Alex, when my day comes, I don't want everyone to sit around and see teary-eyed, look at old photos of me in a cramped and really hot room. I want everyone to have a big old party, and then when I'm all done, I want you to go out to my favorite golf course and spread my ashes across the driving range. And that gave me an idea. So I decided to make Eternity. It would be a company that encompasses a bunch of products that would actually help to make that last day, that grim reminder, into a celebration of a great life lived that it helps people, once they get closer and closer to that day, that they're not looking at it with, with uh, sadness and looking back on things they failed, but looking back on the great things they did and helping their family to get closure instead of seeing that as a clo so closely approaching tragedy. So let me talk about the process first. Essentially, it would increase crem cremation because there's a big problem with overcrowding in cemeteries. It's projected that by 2041, there'll be no more space to actually bury the deceased and that leaves an issue. What do you do? So we, this will help actually uh, get people onto the idea of cremation. So once the ashes are received, we would send them to eternity, where they would be used in the products that are currently available. 
What are the products, you ask? Let's find out. First of all is the golf ball. Essentially what this would be is, has anyone ever been pranked by an exploding golf ball? Well, essentially it's two plastic halves that encompass a large amount of powder, which in this case would be the deceased ashes. It would be an easy way to disperse the ashes in a fun way, which would keep it light and lighthearted, that the family would enjoy. The plus part is actually that there's no projectile, so it can be done almost anywhere that the deceased requests to be spread. Next is the eternity itself. Using a compression method, the ashes could actually be made into a set of golf tees that could be taken for future games so that the deceased could be playing his favorite game even in the afterlife. And lastly, if you want a more permanent solution, something to remember the deceased by, you can actually use that same compression method used in gemstones to make a ball marker using a simple rounded top with a customizable base using either metal or plastic. And with that, I can see my time. Um, fantastic fame, I love it, that's so clever. Uh, have you done any market research with this to see what the market is, what the response is? Yes, so I've actually worked at a country club for six years. I have actually brought it up to some of my clients when I'm caddying there, and they think it would be a great thing because a lot of the times, they are so connected to the club that they've spent years at, that it just seems like the best thing they could do. Because a lot of times, no one wants to think about death. But by using this, you can make it into a, not much less macabre idea, but into a more celebration of life. You, you, you present really well, and it's very creative. Thank you. Uh, how much further with the concept have you gone? So these are the big three right now, and obviously it's a very limited market to lifelong golfers, right? But the idea is, like I've said, this would be a gateway into a new area of trying to, re, re, like not transform, but reconfigure the idea of the end of life. What, taking away from someone sitting in a hospital waiting for the end into become, it's a, just a revelation of looking back at someone's amazing life and allowing the families to have a lot more closure than they would get just by thinking, oh, this is so sad, we're never gonna see him again. So a lot of this already exists. Uh, like I said, there's actually already a process to make gemstones out of deceased ashes. Uh, and that process could be used here and with the teas to a much less extent with the teas because you still want them to function. Uh, however, here is the exact same process. And then with the golf ball, those already exist. Like I said, with the uh, exploding golf ball prank things, all you'd have to do is get the molds from those and substitute out the dye powder they use for the ashes. In addition, any ex ex excess ashes could still be sent back to the family to be traditionally used. Do you have any asks or help that you need from anyone in this room? Money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So many innovative ideas here today. Each of them unique in their own way. And speaking of ideas, the first blue patent, what do you think was the main component? I didn't even know that blue was patented, but you know, apparently it is. So what do you think was the main component of that? It was fish. And the patent was issued in 1750. I bet you never thought fish could be used for glue, right? So let's welcome our next presenter, and that is Jonathan Mazur. Hi, I am John Major, and I'm one of the co-founders of AI for Art. Okay, so let's take a look at artificial intelligence for one minute. Um, it is one of the largest growing buzzwords as well as some of the most, one of the most researched topics in the last year. Some of the problems with the current image generation technology we're seeing, however, is that it is generating images with untraceable um, and unsightable sources. We don't have a way to uh, use them in academia really freely, and 
we don't have a way to credit our artists that are feeding into these algorithms that are creating these images. AI for Art's idea is based in the concept that we are, would be able to track the images that this machine will, uh, is going to go ahead and create. Um, this is an already existing technology uh, through something similar to how NFTs function. We would embed the images that the uh, machine creates with a NFT-like tag so that when you go back later you could reference them, you could have a citation for them, and you would also be able to trace them wherever they go on the internet. Our algorithm would work by linking images uh, created and uh, fed into our system to uh, image generated using our system. So if we take a look at A and B, let's say artist creates a red hat, A. Another artist creates an image of a dog, B. Our algorithm then, uh, when a user goes through and types in, I want a dog in a red hat, they're gonna be able to get image C with a tag, and then we're gonna be able to uh, trace back to uh, the creators of A and B and give them a portion of the profits that uh, the user of the site uh, is paying us to use our uh, machine learning. Um, <laughs> with my creative background and my co-founder's um, expertise in database systems, we already have a solid foundation. What we are looking for is uh, novel uh, software developers and or somebody who is familiar with machine learning expertise that would be able to help us uh, along our journey. Uh, do we have any other questions? I think um, that's a fair, fair question. Uh, we could see it potentially, but I think deepfakes are a little bit of a different issue because it's a video, typically. Um, I'm not sure that our platform would be able to tackle that. Okay. Have you thought about uh, who your, your customer kind of who might pay for this? Absolutely, yeah. So we have um, kind of two customer bases. We have the people that are feeding images into the algorithm. So that is like the uh, creators in a sense, and we have like the users who are the people that are paying for credits. People that are paying for credits are very, uh, uh, people like us pay for them to use on <laughs> slides, or uh, we'll have credits uh, for various other, I've heard of people using them on t-shirt companies and many other things, yeah. Okay, this is a really good you covered a lot of bases and you're answering these questions like, like this, so I'm just gonna highly encourage you to keep going. And I like the idea of uh, seeking other talent. So think about your team, who you, you know, what you two bring to the table, and as you grow and scale, just think about who else you might need and lean on your network. So I just wanna say, well done. Not then. Thank you very much. And as we move on to our next presenter, here's something for us to think about. When was the first pair of wearable eyeglasses invented? How early do you think it was? Someone said B. Well, Turns out it's D. Really long time ago, yeah, apparently. <laughs> and they were designed by an Italian named, well, I did not practice how to say that name, but I'm going to try. Salvino Dalmati. If anyone speaks Italian, you can tell me if that's correct. <laughs> okay, so let's welcome our next presenter, and that is Nyasha Milanzi. Nyasha? <laughs> Hello, 
I hope you can all hear me. So I am Yasha. Um, and here I take, I am actually a Master of, Science, Master of Sustainable Communities, a uh, uh, first year graduate student, and my background is in electrical engineering, where I made a very innovative um, um, black carbon sensor for air quality measurements, which is a very successful uh, idea. So I'm now trying to turn my idea into uh, a business. So this is the problem that I was trying to solve, or I'm trying to solve. So in Africa, 970 million people use uh, biomass for cooking, and emissions from uh, cooking they also include like uh, black carbon, which can subsequently uh, cause uh, uh, various uh, uh, diseases like respiratory diseases. And then the issue is that there is a missing um, uh, inventory of black carbon in a recent air quality measurements in Africa and even in the US. So this is because black carbon is very uh, expensive to, to measure. So it ranges from 3,000 to 20,000 uh, dollars. So what I did essentially was to look at all the technologies that are uh, around there and brainstormed for like straight three months back and forth with my advisors and came up with this uh, uh, working prototype actually, and this prototype was around uh, 500, I mean 500 uh, pounds, and it enables uh, widespread deployment of high, uh, so that we get high resolution data collection because we can uh, deploy large num huge numbers of this sensor. Uh, and then uh, it also has, um, uh, I mean, you can incorporate different kinds of communication, and then in this case, I'm just going to highlight Wi Fi and SD card module. Um, yeah. So, essentially, this is how it could look like. Let's say this is uh, the black carbon sensors being deployed in an air quality um, monitoring network, and the data that we get, uh, maybe via Wi Fi, different kind of communication modules depending on the user's preferences. And then here we have like a policy maker who is able to actually make uh, informed policies of air quality for people, for example, in Africa. And then also uh, an air quality researcher is also able to make policy recommendations for the policy maker. Thank you. <laughs> but also I wanted to add that like, um, I think at the moment it's just that like, I know that uh, this technology uh, works and it has a demand, in, especially with air quality researchers, uh, but just that like, at the moment I'm just trying to turn it into a business. So I think that's where I need more help. Yeah. So any questions for me? How many of these do you think you, like, per like square foot or per area, like, how many of these are needed in an area to fully understand the air quality in a city or town? Uh, the, so that is a good question. I think it would depend on um, it would depend on like what kind of resolution you're looking for, right? As an air quality research. So I don't have much experience with that. I just have experience with like building the technology. So now maybe I have to talk with uh, air quality research like what kind of resolution they are looking for. Um, yeah. There does seem like a number of ways you can go with this on, uh, you know, you talked about kind of on a home level, on more of a uh, city level in terms of like we thought about um, what is your approach for surveying those different potential customers or kind of outreach? Uh, so at the moment I've not done like quite of like market research in that regard, but I think I measured uh, like how people like if people would like this technology. For example, earlier this year in April, I actually presented this idea at uh, European Geosciences Union conference in Austria, and I mean like all the PhD students, the professors loved this idea because they see because them themselves they are not able to afford to measure black carbon, so they love this idea. And earlier this year as well, when I presented the same idea at uh, University of Columbia. The researchers, they even like some of them like send me emails like, can we donate so that you make this idea into reality? That's some great validation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional comments, questions? All right.
Thank you, judges, for your feedback. And here is another thing for us to think about. When was the Apple Macintosh computer introduced to the general public? So many of us use a Mac, and we know when the first one was introduced to the public? Well, the answer to that is in 1984. So the first one was introduced on January 24th, 1984. And moving on, let's welcome the next presenter, who is Jude Cookter. Hi, everyone. I'm Jude. And this is OpenAG, a platform to make craft data insights accessible for all people. So, our good Agriculture has existed in an open loop system for thousands of years where we sow, nurture, and then harvest. But in the advent of the digital age, now we have the introduction of ag tech, where in every part of the process, we use data, we collect data, and use data to make decisions on crops. The issue is these solutions use expensive custom satellite imagery and sensors that must be installed, maintained, and upgraded. And for small farmers domestically and international markets that are growing, this capital expenditure is just a non-starter. So at OpenAG, we plan to use open and free data and machine learning to give free insights and simplifying ag tech. So from these international organizations, we collect information such as temperature, weather, and humidity data, and run it into our ML systems that collect it and provide it with a simple and easy to use platform that the farmers can visit and see simple insights. And also we collect satellite information that is free as well from these organizations. And by running the same machine learning systems on it, we can calculate crop health and crop yield, also on the same platform. And using this free data, we can find a hundredth the price of the other commercial systems. And once developed, our systems become more accurate and more developed automatically at no additional cost to us. And we can predict food events such as disease outbreaks or food shortages months before they occur because of our data. And then we leverage cloud technology for, to be able to access the platform from any internet connected device anywhere in the world, at any place, at any time. We plan to develop first with wheat, rice, soy, some flour and maize. Thank you. satellites to specifically target a lot of land, and by, for example, NASA scans the whole Earth every six days. So using that free data and running into machine learning algorithms uses data from the past. So past data, past yield data, we can calculate um, on this large corpus of data specific variables for specific farms and specific plots. satellite imagery to see um, if they were diseased, you would see the um, first um, impact to the growth. So for example, grapes, apples, or in trees, covered by vegetation is a more difficult problem. But in the future with bands, we could possibly purchase at a bulk scale um, more data, for example, infrared ray um, analysis, and that will allow us to maybe expand further. You mentioned that you're open source or kind of that like a fraction of the price. Are you expecting to still uh, to make this openly available? Or are you expecting to sell it to say farmers or other organizations? Sure. First off, we plan to deploy domestically in the United States with small farms and see if it really catches on and then build a strong product. And then if we can um, correct profits from that market, expanding to an overseas market, for example, third world countries, where these um, farmers have never had access to any kind of technology. 
So if we could subsidize that, that would be more of the open and yeah. form like that. Yeah. All right, thank you. So I'd just like to say that you have all been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much to all those who came to support your friends. Thank you so much to our wonderful judges for the amazing feedback that you have given. And thank you to all the participants for your wonderful ideas. Can you just give a round of applause for yourself? Thank you so much. And that was our last presentation. So we are moving to the round of determining our winners. Everyone here is a winner and we want to just you know, call out specific people who have done exceptionally well. So in order to vote for your audience favorite, which is one of the awards we'll be giving tonight, you can just scan the QR code, or you can text Lisa Kes Casper. Yeah. Sorry. You can text Lisa Casper 152 to 37607, and then immediately you can just choose from, um, you can choose from these letters and you text it to that number. So I'm just gonna be flipping between these slides because you know we have up to K here. So I'll just go here so you can scan the QR code. I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that, to choose whatever option you want to go with. Um, sorry, Lisa, yeah. can the dog? Okay, yes, the dogs can choose their audience favorite. Okay, it looks like everyone has scanned or texted. So I'll be moving to the next slide so you can see the presenters, their idea, and the letter. If you're using the poll, you, you will not see a letter, but for those who are texting, you're gonna use a letter. Okay, this is the first, the next. Okay, about 30 more seconds. All right, it looks like everyone has made your choice. Thank you very much. And we're gonna take a short break, 10 minutes, and we'll be back to hear our winners for tonight. Thank you very much, everyone. All right, everyone. Hello, hello. So it's the moment that we've all been waiting for. We are ready to present the awards. So, um, yeah. So when I call your name, um, I'll say the word, call your name, and please come up and I'll present the certificate. So, uh, oh, sure. Thank you. Yes, we're no longer on a short break. <laughs> Winners! Yay! Okay, now we're there. All right, uh, so first we have uh, the Honorable Mention Award, and this goes to Niyasha.
In second place, we have Alex. Hi, good evening. Um, I want to say before I present the word for uh, audience favorite that really enjoyed tonight. You all did a wonderful job. You bring great energy and enthusiasm and do keep going with your ideas, please. Hope to see you in January's pitch competition, which I'm sure you'll hear more about soon. So, the audience favorite award is goes to uh, Olamide. wonderful marketing per people who has made such a difference in helping to get the word out to all of our students about these kinds of events. And Jessie Neese, she's not with us right now, but she's been behind the scenes helping to get the word out. Um, so that's really important work and we appreciate the Palace team and all that they're doing. And I also want to acknowledge um, the, the collaboration and the partnership between the Office of Innovation and, and Commercialization and the College of Business and the fact that we are a collaboration allows us to give uh, resources to all of our students, right? So as you innovators out there, if you have an idea, reach out to us and we'll connect you to someone within our network and we want to see you continue and move your ideas forward. We're all champions here for your ideas. We're a team. And um, let me just check my notes because I don't want to go, oh no, I forgot somebody. Um, SLS, we want to thank SLS for helping to make this possible. Thank you for our production. <laughs> And also catering. 
So they're not here, but we appreciate them too. Um, and I think that's it. Okay, so Dan mentioned that coming, um, coming attractions, right? So Bob Mark Business Model Pitch Competition is coming up. So this is the idea pitch competition. This is kind of like low stakes, right? Have fun, get your idea out there, get used to that pitch, being in that pitch environment. And January is going to get a little bit more serious. Um, stakes are a little higher. The prize money is a little higher. First prize is two thousand dollars, so it's it's getting it's getting serious. But we have two comp two workshops that we hope that you'll take advantage of. So Husky Innovate is hosting business model boot camp to help students prep for their um, their their uh, pitch in January. And the next, um, the other one is explaining the market opportunity. So those are two that are really gonna give you a heads up and then you'll have the entire Christmas break to hone your pitch. So we hope to hear from you again and um, stay tuned. And oh my gosh, how could I forget? Praise, <laughs> oh my gosh, praise has really made this night special. So I'm just looking out at my audience and I see her. <laughs> So she's our latest um, addition to the Husky Innovate family. She is um, an intern with us, and we're so happy to have her. So she's done a great job emceeing tonight, and I hope you've all enjoyed her personality as much as we do. All right, let's see. What else does this have? No, I'm on the wrong way. And that's it. Congratulations. Special thanks. Thank you to our audience and to everyone for joining us, to our partners, and we look forward to seeing you again in January. So thanks. Thank you.